Welcome everyone to this Moorpark College webinar. Before we begin, uh, just a few disclaimers. Um, uh, this webinar is being recorded for archival purposes. Additionally, this webinar has been configured to ensure a safe and positive environment for all participants. Therefore, disruptive, threatening, inappropriate, and all other Zoom bombing behavior will not be tolerated. Closed captioning uh, is not currently available, but we are working on correcting some uh, uh, technical challenges. So do stay tuned uh, in the chat box throughout this uh, presentation uh, for closed captioning availability. And then finally, you may type questions for the panelists at any time during this webinar using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Thank you very much and enjoy the show. Thanks so much, Michael. So my name is Allison Barton and I'm the health educator here at the Moore Park College Student Health Center. And I would, I am going to be presenting this today with my colleague, Elmer Guardado. Um, Elmer is a postdoctoral fellow at the Moore Park College Student Health Center. He received his PsyD in clinical psychology at the University of Laverne. His areas of interest include sports, psychology, social justice, equity and inclusion, and working with first generation students of color and student athletes. Um, my area of expertise in this um, topic um, is that I am a recovering insomniac. So I have a lot of experience with the, um, the health problem and lots of, uh, lots of uh, solutions uh, that I can help bring to the fore. So, uh, so anyway, without any further ado, let us get started. So next slide, please. So um, as we look at this presentation today, we're going to be just exploring these aspects of sleep. We'll probably answer a lot of your questions during the presentation, but we will also have time at the end to, to ask questions uh, if you have any le left over. Next slide. So um, as you can imagine, there are lots of cultural implications when we're considering sleep. Probably all of us have uh, heard about siestas or midday sleep uh, periods. Um, it's uh, interesting to note that in the United States, monophasic sleep is considered the norm and monophasic sleep is just sleeping all at one time. In Mediterranean and Latin American cultures, biphasic sleep is the norm. So people sleep five to seven hours at night and then they take a siesta or a long nap during the afternoon, usually after a big noon meal. The same is true for hot weather countries. There are lots of individual cycles as well. Electricity has affected our sleep patterns as well and that's partly, uh, partly a cultural uh, concept too. We used to sleep more at night, especially during the long winter nights because there wasn't uh, uh, artificial light to keep folks awake. And the same is true in places where we have long days and short nights. Uh, young adults in the United States tend to get the least sleep of all age groups, largely because of being in college or doing shift work or childbearing or child rearing. There are gender differences with women getting less sleep uh, of all age groups, largely because of being in college or doing shift work. Um, uh, and also because of other factors. African Americans tend to get less sleep than other ethnicities too, and we'll find out more about that in a bit. Uh, COVID-19 and online learning can have an impact too. If any of you were listening earlier to Elmer's presentation on coping with COVID, you'll have uh, heard that um, students are not going outside, they're working in sleeping quarters, standing versus sitting, work-life balances, using bed as a chair, uh, creating all kinds of uh, difficulties with uh, boundaries. All right, next slide. So we have a little poll uh, that we'd like uh, to have everybody um, take. If you would set that up and Elmer, take it away. Thank you, Alison. So just to, you know, kind of reiterate what Alison said about culture, I think it's important to understand um, the culture around sleep in the U.S. and the messages around sleep. So when it comes to sleep, 
um, in the US, oftentimes um, people who get less sleep are praised um, more than people who get more sleep because you know there's these messages around who gets more sleep. Um, you know, if you're sleeping more, that means you're not working hard enough, right? And especially in college, you know, college students are known to not have enough, you know, not get enough sleep. So I think we'll talk a little bit about some of the toxic messages around um, sleep that exists in, you know, in, in American culture. So the poll that um, we want to first start off with is, I want you to all answer a few questions in terms of how much sleep do you get per night during the weeknights? And also, how much sleep do you get per night during the weekends? So answer that. And then the third question is, compared to your pre-COVID daily sleep amount, how much sleep are you getting now? So, um, you know, are you getting the same amount? Are you getting more sleep or are you getting less sleep? So let's take a minute or so to, um, to answer those questions and then we can see the results are. So just to um, reiterate, you know, I think the question is, you know, do we have a problem when it comes to sleep in the U.S.? Or, you know, we're talking a little bit about, you know, different sleep habits and sleep routines mm -hmm. and, and beliefs in different cultures. Um, but again, you know, I think it's worth talking about whether the messages around sleep are having a negative impact on people's ability, you know, people's mental health and well-being. So let's wait a few seconds. Okay, so you're going to have to help me out, Alice, in terms of the poll results. So, so the, Michael, do we have results? There okay. we go. Okay, so for the first question, you know, it seems like, you know, more people are getting seven to nine hours, 63% of, you know, the answers, you know, of you answer seven to nine hours versus 38% answer less than seven hours. It seems like people are getting more sleep on the weekends than the weeknights, you know, and that can be attributed to many different reasons, right? We often have to work or go to school or study late during, you know, during the week. And then weekends are usually, a lot of people take the time to catch up on sleep or get, you know, don't have as much to do during the weekends, right? Now, let's see, when it comes to the third question, compared to what has the COVID, how has COVID impacted um, your sleep? And, you know, it seems like for a lot of people, they're getting more sleep every day, you know, and 38% said that they get about the same amount, right? And only 13% get, get less sleep each day. So it seems like most people are either getting the same amount of sleep that they were getting before this pandemic or getting more sleep. And, you know, we were, we're going to talk a little bit about that because, you know, why is that the case? Are people just at home more? Or, um, you know, do they not have to wake up early to go to work or go to school? Um, or are people depressed and they find themselves sleeping more more hours than normal. I think it's important to understand what some of those reasons are. Thank you for answering that poll. We'll have other poll questions as well as we go through this um, presentation. So let's go to the next slide. So just in case you were wondering, we have um, some uh, interesting sleep data from our uh, Moorpark College uh, 
questionnaire that we did last year, last fall, 2019, uh, the National College Health Assessment. And in this, we learned that one in three MC students reports taking longer than 30 minutes to fall asleep, which is a, a sign of difficulty sleeping. Over half of the respondents, 54%, get less than seven hours of sleep per weeknight. And, uh, What's important to know is that uh, people that are young adults, college-age people, 18 to 25, um, should be getting, and so uh, this is, you know, it's problematic. Um, and then more than one in three students reported feeling tired or sleepy on most days. Uh, and that's another indicator that the, um, either the amount of sleep or the quality of sleep are not great. Um, and then we also uh, do a, um, a PHQ-9 questionnaire, which is a mental health questionnaire for, uh, we have all of the students that visit the Student Health Center uh, do that questionnaire. And the top two complaints on it were difficulty sleeping and feeling tired. So obviously we have a problem. And it's not a surprise to those of us who have been to college before, right? that uh, sleep, is, sleep is at a premium and it's very difficult for a number of reasons that we'll uh, continue ex to explore as we go through our presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so, you know, I think it's, you know, there is a general understanding or, you know, um, collective understanding that Americans are not getting enough sleep, right? And, you know, this is something that was going on, you know, that's true pre-pandemic and even during the pandemic as well. So roughly 33% of Americans report that they are not getting enough sleep. So that can be attributed to many different reasons. Um, you know, their work schedule, um, the environment that they're in, you know, the, the negative messages or the toxic messages around, around sleep, right? Or, you know, having a difficult time falling asleep, right? You know, Americans tend to be, you know, tend to report being more stressed, right? And having many different stressors, economic stressors, class stressors, um, different kinds of stressors that can keep people up at night, as you can see in this, um, in this sort of comic, right? Um, you know, it's every time that somebody is about to go to sleep that they start to think about all these different things and if you ever find yourself having a racing thoughts, right, or having all these different thoughts right before you're going to sleep, that's usually very common for a lot of people who are feeling anxious or are feeling stressed about a number of things when they start to think about all these things, um, to, you know, at the end of the day, right? So let's go to the next slide. So I think it's worth you know, discussing some of the racial and economic disparities when it comes to sleep. So, you know, for a lot of communities, you know, people who come from communities of color or low income neighborhoods, you know, sometimes, you know, they might not be getting enough sleep because of the work schedule. You know, a lot of jobs that, um, you know, people tend to take that come from those communities are maybe graveyard shifts right, which can kind of um, dysregulate your sleeping schedule. Or you might find yourself, um, you know, not having the privacy that you need, you know, when it comes to, you know, um, being able to sleep soundly, right, if you're sharing a room with a family member, if you have multiple families living in the same home, but also the stress that comes from, you know, the economic situation, right? So, you know, there's a lot of people who are living paycheck to paycheck, who you know are having to work two jobs, who are constantly worried how they're going to put food on the table. And I think this is very relevant with the pandemic today, where there's a lot of different stressors around um, people's economic situations. So people with lower SES um, or who lower economic means might feel more stress about um, about money which can, you know, um, negatively impact their ability to sleep. And when it comes to racial disparities, that goes hand in hand with economic disparities because, it, you, know, um, you know, communities of color, racial minorities tend to have, you know, 
um, for the most part, tend to be of low SES or low economic situations, which can add to the stressor, um, you know, when it comes to sleep. And with everything that's going on right now with um, the racial injustices and the racial protests, that's something added to a lot of people of color, a lot of students of color, or just individuals of color who might be dealing with being triggered with microaggressions or having to think about all the times that they have experienced discrimination, right? So you see some mental health aspects, but also some economic um, you know, factors that contribute to not getting enough sleep from that. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Oh, uh, so, you want to answer so this is actually uh, where we have a little video that we'd like to okay. show you about this topic. Is a temple, but mine is also an underfunded museum of natural history. It shuts down at noon because I didn't get enough sleep from the night before. I am a terrible sleeper. It turns out I'm not alone in this. This is hard to hear, but no shocker, really. The Centers for Disease Control say insufficient sleep is a public health epidemic. More than a third of Americans aren't getting enough sleep. The recommended amount of sleep varies by age, with newborns needing the most and adults needing at least seven hours. But while over 60% of Americans are getting enough restful sleep, there's a striking disparity when you look at race. Only a little over half of Black Americans reported getting seven hours or more of sleep. Sleep is essential to health. Everyone has to do it. So why aren't Black Americans getting enough of it? What does a good night's sleep look like? A good night's sleep is spending at least 85% of the time sleeping in the bed. Like an actual bed. Not on the floor, not on the couch, not underneath someone's desk. Sorry, Sam. Uh, falling asleep in 30 minutes or under, waking up only once per night. And if you do wake up, it's for less than 20 minutes. And don't forget the recommended seven hours or more of sleep. Bad sleep is spending less than 74% of sleeping time in bed, taking more than an hour to fall asleep, waking up numerous times throughout the night, and if you do wake up, it's for 41 minutes or more during the night. Getting too little or bad sleep can have negative effects. There's a suspicion that disparities in sleep are also contributing to disparities in other areas in health, like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and maybe even early death. All these health risks and conditions disproportionately affect Black Americans, who are five times more likely to get short sleep. Researchers point to stress caused by discrimination as one strong possibility. Since 2000, over 700 published studies have established a connection between discrimination and physical and mental wellness. In one study, scientists found that the more discrimination a person felt, the less deep sleep they experienced. The Black participants of this study perceived more discrimination and slept more in light sleep and less in deep sleep. Poor sleep quality is also strongly associated with how much money you make. Black Americans are more likely to live in poverty compared to white Americans. It's a function of economics. It shows people who are working shifts probably won't get the best sleep compared to folks who have a consistent schedule. Generally, people who have more opportunities, more control over their lives, are also better sleepers. There's a connection between neighborhood quality and sleep quality too. Poor communities are faced with higher pollution, elevated noise levels, crime, greater population density, and sometimes limited access to air conditioning. Even if Black families are middle income, they're more likely to live in poorer neighborhoods, which means these environmental factors could still influence their sleep. All of these things, the environment, the economy, stress, can compound on existing health conditions. A consistent finding is that when we see sleep disruptions, we also start seeing signs of insulin resistance, which is a precursor to diabetes. You start to see signs of increased appetite. You start to see signs that people aren't regulating their metabolism so well. Long-term stress can lead to chronic elevated cortisol levels, which suppress the immune system, increase blood pressure, contribute to obesity, and more. Obesity, which affects almost half of all Black adults in the U.S., contributes to other serious sleep conditions like sleep apnea, a disorder where breathing is interrupted during sleep. And sleep apnea increases the risk for stroke and heart attack. 
bad sleep can even change your DNA. Every single cell of your body has a clock that cycles on and off throughout the day. All these clocks are producing feedback loops. So when you disrupt the big clock in your brain, you're probably going to disrupt some of these little clocks throughout your body. Even modest sleep loss can trigger the immune system's inflammatory response to disease and injury. It all becomes a vicious cycle, leading to worsening health conditions. Having enough good sleep, it's a big deal. But just telling people to get more sleep probably isn't that effective. Fixing the sleep gap means handling it at both the individual level and the policy level. Having accessible and affordable public transportation and housing near jobs would help workers spend less time commuting and more time sleeping. Employers could use sleep wellness programs to incentivize workers to catch up on their Zs, though a government mandate would make this more widespread. Even some researchers are using community outreach to guide neighborhoods to better sleep. Then there are steps people can take for more restful sleep. It seems pretty clear that there's a correlation between bad sleep and poor health outcomes. It's still not known if you give people better sleep, if those health outcomes will then improve. And this research is still ongoing, so this is going to be a really key thing to know, that if we can improve people's sleep, we may be able to make them healthier. And maybe tackling other inequalities in the U.S. would be more of a reality and less of a dream. Now we're ready for the next slide. <laughs> so, um, and just to recap uh, that this very topic was um, discussed earlier today when we talked about um, some of these issues in some of the earlier presentations and we'll talk a little bit more about it in the social justice uh, panel discussion tomorrow. So stay tuned and come back. Um, but back to our uh, general student population here at Park College. It's true, we said it earlier, uh, college students need seven to nine hours sleep. And I always love to say that in classrooms because the laugh I get is probably the best laugh of the presentation. Um, they're the least likely to get those hours. Um, we're gonna do a poll, but later. So uh, next slide, please. So, College students have they have their own culture, as you may have guessed. Uh, it wasn't on my cultural slide earlier, but it's a kind of a, a an interesting thing to think about what what the bar what the barriers are to good sleep exist with college students. There's the learning uh, the work life school balance. Um, also COVID and the whole uh, fatigue from Zoom, there's childbearing, child rearing. Uh, a lot of our students work and are essential workers now, but they have no control over their uh, work hours a lot of times. They're the low person on the totem pole often. Um, and also uh, returning home, lack of privacy, lack of, um, you know, lack of, ability to make decisions in their own homes because they're living with their, you know, their parents and that kind of thing. Elmer, do you have anything to add to this one? Yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge how our, you know, people's sleeping environments have changed since the pandemic. So like you mentioned, Allison, you know, people might have their grandparents um, living with them because of everything that's going on. And, you know, they're not wanting to have them be in in um, senior living communities. Um, or you have a returning sibling from college who's, um, to, you know, who's also taking classes online and how do you have to share a room where otherwise you wouldn't. So you're starting to see a lot of disruption when it comes to sleeping habits, sleeping routines, which what we're gonna talk about later is essential to being able to get good sleep. All right, next slide, please. So um, many of us uh, are aware of this, but for some of us, this is new news, um, but there's, there's a whole science behind sleep and sleep biology. Next slide, please. And one thing that's important to realize is that we have stages of sleep, um, sleep cycles. This is the, if you see this 
picture here, that's the kind of what a sleep cycle would look like. Um, the sleep cycles last uh, 90 to 120 minutes. Um, there are usually four to five uh, cycles in a typical eight hour uh, night of sleep or day of sleep if you're a shift worker. So stage one is wakefulness uh, to sleep, kind of the lightest stage of sleep. You might even not think that you're asleep while that's happening. Um, and then stage two is the largest percentage of sleep time. It's, uh, it's about 45 to 55%. Um, you can see what's going on there. The breathing pattern and heart rate slows. There's a slight decrease in body temperature. Um, in uh, stage three, it's referred to as deep sleep, about, <clears throat> excuse me, 10 to 20% of total sleep. Mm. And it decreases with age. Uh, it's the most difficult time to arouse a sleeper. And it's the most typical time for paras parasomnias to occur. And a parasomnia is just an abnormal or unusual behavior of the nervous system during sleep. So things like sleepwalking, nightmares, sleep paralysis, those kinds of things are what happens um, when somebody has a parasomnia. And then the next stage is um, REM sleep. So bursts of rapid eye movements are the defining feature of this stage. Um, inactivity of all voluntary muscles, uh, respiratory variability, um, you know, about 18 to 23% of total sleep. And it's typically associated with vivid dreaming. So that's usually when you're dreaming. Some research suggests that it is a time of memory consolidation, which is a really important thing for our students, right? Um, when you learn something, you got to sleep after you learn it in order to consolidate that uh, information in your brain, and that's when it happens. So when you, um, so when you interfere with REM sleep, you're actually interfering with, uh, with learning. What can you, how, how do people interfere with their REM sleep? Well, it's depressed or delayed by alcohol, uh, sedative or hypnotic drugs, barbiturates, stimulants, a lot of different things interfere, especially substances interfere with REM sleep. So you can see that it's kind of a double whammy when it comes to learning. So as cycles continue uh, throughout the night, the percentage of REM sleep in each cycle increases. Next slide, please. So dreams <clears throat> have meant lots of things to lots of people throughout history. Uh, the ancient cultures of Mesopotamia and, Assyr and Assyria thought that they were important predictors of the future. Ancient Greeks brought sick people to special temples called As uh, Aslepions to incubate their dreams. They believed that the god Asclepius or one of his children would vision the patient and offer cures or one of the priests would interpret the patient's dreams to develop the cure. Um, during the Middle Ages, Islamic uh, scholars differentiated between the meaning and the source of dreams. And one scholar wrote that the meaning of a dream depends on the dreamer. And that's a little bit closer to uh, our current ideas about dreaming. So Freud and Jung both felt that dreams were an important part of psychoanalysis, but disagreed on the meanings of dreams. So today, in a 2009 study conducted in the United States, India, and South Korea, 74% of Indians, 65% of South Koreans, and 56% of Americans believe that their dream content provided them with meaningful insight into their unconscious beliefs and desires, and that their dreams are more significant to them than conscious thought, which is so interesting. For example, people are more likely to miss a flight if they dream about it crashing than if they thought about the plane crashing the evening before. I just think that's so fascinating. Uh, people are likely to consider dreams if they agree with the dreams. I mean, um, so currently, the, the belief is that there's no validity in dream interpretation, but many people have been experiencing bad dreams during COVID-19, which mirror their anxiety. So, Michael, could we do the second poll, please?
So we'll take just another few seconds to answer that one question. All right, so while we wait for the response, maybe we'll go to the next slide. Oh, here we go. So most of us have not been having bad dreams since the pandemic started. So that's that's interesting, but many of us have. Be interesting to know if that's changed between pre and post COVID. Thank you. Thank you for participating in the poll. All right, so next uh, next slide, please. All right, so sleep on it turns out to be good advice. Um, so uh, remember that sleep is an important part of consolidation of learning and pulling an all, but so, so for students, pulling an all nighter is a really bad idea if you want to learn. And that if there's one thing that you take away from this, if you're a student, is that this whole idea of, you know, staying up all night studying for an exam that's going to get you where you want to go no the opposite is that sleep is a tool and that's really important so this photo is of friedrich august um, kikuli and uh, he's a german scientist was a german scientist who figured out the structure of the benzene ring during a daydream he saw a snake biting its tail which to him was the obvious sign that the chemical had a circular structure rather than a linear one and if you look at this slide you can see all these really cool ideas that occurred to the person who thought of them during a dream. If you want to know more about it, there's a famous science, so it's www.famousscientist.org for some really cool examples of things that have happened um, to or th ideas that have occurred to scientists uh, during sleep. And I bet you, you can think of some times when you've had a dream uh, that kind of solved your problem or at least gave you the idea for the solution. Next slide, please. So um, nightmares uh, tend to be the idea of threat rehearsal or review of an upsetting events. They usually happen during the end of REM sleep. Mostly they happen in childhood and to girls more than boys. They can be caused by illness or medication and they can be very disruptive. Um, so if anybody's having, if, ever, if anybody would like to share uh, what kind of bad dream themes that you have had or have in the Q&A, you're welcome to do so. No pressure, though. Um, so it's one thing to know is that it's a it's a universally human experience to have nightmares, at least at some point in your life. Um, and I think it's really interesting to hear people's different interpretations of what they even think is a nightmare. Um, I just had a very uh, interesting conversation with my mother-in-law the other day about this in which I, she was describing uh, what she thought was in, what she considers to be a nightmare and for her it was, but what I consider to be more like a frustration dream, you know, like where uh, you, you dream that you just can't get your work done or that you forgot to go to class and you didn't get to take the, you know, the test or whatever. I don't, I consider those to be more frustrating uh, and she considers those to be full on nightmares. So uh, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about problems associated with poor sleep. So the video that we just watched really talked about some of the physical impacts of not getting enough sleep. And, you know, it disrupts you know, certain systems in your body. It disrupts your ability to, um, you know, consolidate memory, um, you know, but there are a lot of mental health impacts, um, you know, with getting poor sleep. So, you know, getting little sleep can leave you vulnerable to, you know, for example, anxiety, can leave you vulnerable to depression and to a lot of mental health um, difficulties, you know, because again, we want to be able to understand that 
getting enough sleep is a protective barrier for a lot of these different mental health um, illnesses, right? Or, or, you know, when it comes to anxiety and depression and, mm -hmm. and some of these other things. So, you know, again, you know, problems, other problems associated with poor sleep, you might find yourself feeling more irritable or, you know, you might find yourself feeling, you know, like your mood is more impacted, right? Or it's negatively impacted. You might find yourself feeling sad, you know, more sad, or you might find yourself having a hard time concentrating, right? Or it might disrupt your level of appetite, right? So, you know, I think it's important to understand that when it comes to things like depression, you know, usually people associate depression with sleeping more but people with depression also find themselves having difficulty sleeping. So it's not always um, sleeping more than eight hours. A lot of people who are experiencing depression might have a hard time um, sleeping or getting less um, hours that they should because they find themselves kind of ruminating and thinking about um, you know, a lot of different things when they're trying to go to sleep. So you know, I think the message that um, we should all take when it comes to you know, problems associated with poor sleep is that it goes beyond physical impact. Um, there's also a lot of mental health impacts when it comes to not getting enough sleep. So sleep is important for your mental health is the message that um, I want you to take away from, uh, from this presentation. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things I've already mentioned. So your brain on no sleep. So you know, one of the things that impacts is your concentration, right? It reduces your ability to focus in class, you know, during conversation with friends or family and your ability to, you know, consolidate information or to be able to remember things. So the next time that you think that putting an all-nighter before an exam will help you, you know, retain the knowledge more, is you know you're actually doing yourself a disservice. You want to be able to get a good night's sleep um, and be able to rest the night before an exam, so that you're able to consolidate that information that you studied the night before, so that you're able to um, retrieve that during the exam. So you know you have other impacts and increases stress. You know stress levels, which can have an impact on blood pressure, can increase weight. Um, you know can decrease sex drive, fatigue and also in increase blood sugar levels, which is more of the physical impacts of it. Um, again, impairs memory, interrupts the consolidation of memories. You might feel like you have more of a foggy brain, so you might not remember what you did a week ago, or you're just having, you know, you might have a hard time kind of remembering things. It can disrupt your eating habits, like I mentioned, it can increase your, you know, increases hunger or appetite um, because your body is trying to make up for the fact that it's tired, you might find yourself needing to eat more. So this is where we talk a little bit about the disruption of certain systems in your body and decreased emotional stability, right? Like I mentioned, you're more irritable, frustrated, you're more angry. You might have very drastic mood swings, right? You might um, find yourself feeling frustrated and you know, feeling angry. And also you might feel very vulnerable and you might feel you know, you might have a hard time dealing with certain things that maybe you would otherwise be able to cope better if you had some good sleep. So again, you know, it makes simple tasks seem harder and it makes difficult tasks seem impossible. So, you know, getting a good night's sleep can make your life a little bit easier. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about sleeping with technology, right? And as you can see in this um, sort of meme, you know, when it's 4.30 a.m. and you desperately need sleep, but you can't take your eyes off your phone, right? So it's important to understand the impact that technology has on our sleep. So, you know, a lot of electronics have, the light that comes out from, the, from electronics can disrupt the process in your brain that um, promotes sleep. So if you find yourself on your phone or using the computer um, late at night, and if, you, you know, and if you're having a hard time falling asleep, that's because the light that's you know, being transmitted from these electronics is disrupting the neurochemicals in your brain that is signaling you, you know, signaling your body that it needs to go to sleep. So you know, 
one of the things that we'll talk a little bit about is how to limit technology use right before you go to sleep or how to use um, you know, special blue light or just special uh, the lighting features on your phone so that it doesn't um, strain your eyes or it doesn't overstimulate um, your brain when you're using it. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, bright light, like I mentioned, you know, it disrupts melatonin, which is the neurotransmitter in your brain that promotes sleep or that signals sleep. Um, you know, the absorption of bright light, you know, delays the release of that. Um, it increases your alertness, right? Usually your brains, when it starts to signal sleep, you know, it's a period of unwinding after a long day, right? And your body's, you know, your mind is sending your body you've had a long day, it's time to go to sleep, it starts to release melatonin. But the problem you know, with using technology is that it disrupts that. You know, the light signals to the brain, it's not sleeping time, right? Or it's still overactivated. Um, you know, the idea of one more text, the idea, okay, one more video, how can that hurt? One more episode, that can delay um, the onset of sleep and can further push you know, the time where you are able to go to sleep. So if it's 2 a.m., you might find yourself not being able to sleep until 3 a.m., right? Because you disrupted kind of that mm. process. Uh, next slide, please. Elmer, we yes. have a question. Uh, one of our participants said, I'll fall asleep. Then I wake up at 3 a.m., get up and work a couple hours. Then I sleep a short while more. So my sleep is interrupted. Right. So this, you know, it's important to have a full consistent um, you know sort of sleep schedule right because you know if you're sleep if you wake up and, um, and you find yourself doing something that's stimulating then that can disrupt the process that you talked about Allison when it comes to having a full cycle of 100% a full cycle of sleep so if you do go to sleep and you wake up in the middle of the night it's recommended that you do, if, you, if you're not able to fall asleep right away, it's recommended that you do something that's relaxing and that doesn't overstimulate your brain. So reading a book, getting out of bed and reading a book or watching um, a TED talk or a documentary that you don't have to think or, you know, or, or, you know, you don't have to be as stimulated so more of a passive viewer but it's definitely recommended doing something that's relaxing rather than doing something like school work which can then lead to you feeling stressed which can then lead you to you know have a difficult time falling back asleep so you know making sure that if you aren't going to just if you are not able to go back to sleep you do something like that rather than you know getting up and starting your day or getting up and getting to things that you haven't gone to right and this is the the toxic message around sleep that you know if you're not sleeping then you should be working right but you know that's oftentimes the problem with not being able to sleep consistently and i hope that i answered the question but feel free to ask um, the question again if you feel like it hasn't been answered so let's talk a little bit about um you know techniques to improve sleep. So this is something that's very important. So being able to have a regular, these are sleep hygiene tips. So it improves your sleeping habits. So being able to have regular, um, you know, being able to have a regular wake time and sleep time. So being able to, if you're gonna go to sleep at midnight, making sure that you're going, you know, you're waking up at a consistent time. So the reason for that is that your brain starts to associate a certain time for signaling sleep, right? Because if you're going to sleep at, at a midnight and waking up at six, and then the next night you're going to sleep at 10 and then waking up at 4 a.m., then your, your brain is not gonna know when it's time for you to go to sleep because it's completely inconsistent. So making sure that you have consistency when you go to sleep and when you wake up. Um, being able to exercise, that kind of relieves some of the anxieties and pent up um, energy that is keeping a lot of people from being able to go to sleep. Um, avoiding stimulants like soda, coffee, alcohol, nicotine, or sugar after 12 p.m. Um, you know, that's something that's very recommended because some of these things disrupt your ability um, to go to sleep. So don't fight sleep. Um, 
you know, if you are able, not able to fall asleep after 30 minutes, we recommend that you get up from your bed and do something like light reading or doing something relaxing. You don't want to be able, you don't want to, you know, lay in your bed and force yourself to go to sleep because then that's going to not make you go to sleep, right? So, you know, being aware of that. Um, no big meals, um, you know, before bed because that can disrupt the process because it's, you know, it's signaling to your body to digest your food and not go to sleep. Um, avoiding your phone 30 minutes prior to sleep. Um, it's recommended that if you're having a hard time getting, staying off your phone to leave it in another room or leave it somewhere where you don't have easy access to it because, you know, as we all have phones, you know, one more task, you know, one more text or you get one more message that you, you're, you feel obligated to check it, which can disrupt that. Developing a sleep ritual exercising, um, having a consistent sleep ritual, stretching, I mean, not exercising, sorry, um, being able to stretch, being able to read a certain book, being able to have that consistent sleep ritual so that, um, you know, you can have better, better quality sleep. So associating your bed for sleep, this is important during the pandemic for a lot of you students who, um, you know, watch lectures or do homework or eat food in your bed or spend most of your day in your bed. You want to be able to, um, you know, limit your bed just for sleeping. So your body learns to associate um, your bed just for sleep rather than digesting food or rather than feeling stressed about school. Being able to reduce noise using earplugs or a noise canceling machine. And when it comes to naps, I know some people um, love taking naps. So if you are gonna take a nap, it should be no longer than 30 minutes um, because if it's longer than 30 minutes, then it disrupts your kind of momentum of the whole day leading up to you feeling so tired that you, were, you, know, that you fall asleep. Because when you disrupt that and you take a nap longer than 30 minutes, then you're not going to be as tired or the momentum is not going to be as high. Um, relaxation and breathing techniques um, that can calm your body and signal your brain that, you know, that nothing going on, nothing, nothing wrong is going on. Because as many of you maybe have experienced when you're trying to go to sleep and you start to think about some of these things and you're having trouble thinking because of your thoughts, usually your thoughts start to increase your heart rate starts to you know, uh, manifest in, in stress and anxiety. So you wanna be able to have a relaxed body before you go to sleep and listening to some of these applications um, on your phones like Headspace or um, the Calm app. You know, and listening to some mindfulness meditation can be very helpful. And then the last thing, the sleep environment. You know, how do you maximize your sleep environment so that you are able to fall asleep? Wearing a mask to reduce light, um, wearing earplugs so that you reduce noise, especially if you're sharing a room with a sibling or with a spouse or with a partner um, or family member. You know, one of the ways that you can sort of deal with that is by wearing a mask or earplugs and maybe having a, a calm, safe physical space. So moving your, move, moving your room around so that you can feel more at peace and more calm. Next slide, please. So I think in the interest of time, I kind of will just go over some of these things. So what is rumination and sleep? So rumination refers to you laying down right before you're going to sleep and you're thinking about what you said or what you did or all your life's problems right before you go to sleep. So usually that makes a lot of people feel anxious, right? If you're thinking about past relationships, past failures, and they're usually negative things and not, you know, for, sometimes they're positive things, but usually rumination leads to feeling anxious. So like this picture shows, you know, your anxieties have anxieties, right? Because you go down this rabbit hole of anxious thoughts. So what are some strategies to consider? You want to keep, you know, a lot of people keep a journal by your bed, um, you know, you write down all your thoughts that are causing you to feel worried. So that's your way of kind of venting or kind of transporting some of these anxieties into something physical so that you're able to kind of relieve um, your brain. So, you know, that's something that you might want to do if you're having difficulty controlling your thoughts or just having a lot of anxious thoughts. You know, making a plan. Sometimes making a plan can be helpful so that, you know, you, you have some solutions or you have a plan of how the process of you going to sleep or your sleeping habits or making a plan of how you're going to deal with some of these issues that you find yourself thinking about late at night. 
you know, and reassuring yourself of your plan. And again, sometimes you don't have to fix all your life's problems right before you go to sleep. Sometimes letting, letting it pass, you know, learning to put it to the side and dealing with it the next day, um, you know, can help reduce some of the anxieties that you might be experiencing. So, you know, so these are some recommendations that, um, that you, can, you can use if you're having difficulties. Next slide, please. So, uh, Elmer, we have a question. If I ruminate about loss, is that a good thing or a bad thing? So, if, you know, processing loss is very important, you know, because you want to be able to acknowledge how you feel regarding the loss. But it's not productive to do that right before you're going to go to sleep, right? So, because that's, that can keep you up all night. So, like I mentioned, if you find yourself ruminating about loss, whether it's the loss of a loved one or the loss of um, relationship um, or friendship or any other type of loss, you know, you can either, you know, keep a journal and write down some of these thoughts and kind of putting it to the side so, you know, tomorrow, you know, the next day you can kind of revisit it and process it during the day, right, or when you have time. Um, but you don't want to do some of these things right before you're going to go to sleep. So this is what I mean about letting it pass and, um, you know, com compartmentalizing it, you know, you know, it doesn't mean that you need to ignore it, acknowledge that it's there, but acknowledge that this isn't the right time to deal with it. Um, and you're going to get to it tomorrow. And there's not, there's no problem with that, right? As long as you eventually get to it, right? Instead of pushing it down forever. All right, thank you. So uh, next slide, please. So just, just quickly, um, we talked a little bit about the immune system being a, a impacted negatively by, uh, by uh, poor sleep. Um, obstructive sleep apnea is becoming more common each year and is characterized by rapidly starting and stopping breathing during sleep. It results in poor sleep at night and daytime sleepiness. Uh, it can increase blood pressure and heart problems and can be a factor in the development of diabetes and can be life-threatening, actually. Um, treatment is with CPAP, uh, pressure through a nasal mask, but other methods can be weight loss, reducing alcohol consumption, and others. Um, we talked about parasomnias earlier. Um, narcolepsy is a, a, is a health associate, uh, problem associated with this, and it's an excessive daytime sleepiness. Uh, cataplexy, which is a sudden and brief loss of muscle tone with strong emotions like laughter or crying. Um, some people experience hallucinations while falling asleep or awakening. And um, some people have deep paralysis while waking or falling asleep. And then, of course, disrupted nighttime sleep to. Next slide, please. So let, let's briefly talk about some comorbidity of having insomnia and mental health disorders. And what I mean by comorbidity is that along with having insomnia, a lot of people also end up having other types of disorders such as anxiety or depression um, or other, you know, other kinds of, of mental health difficulties. So let's go to the next slide, please. So sleep, disturb sleep disturbance is associated with stress for everybody. But however, you know, consistent chronic sleep disturbance is also a core symptom of you know, mental health disorders such as generalized anxiety disorder or major depressive disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder, right? So, you know, there's a difference between not getting enough sleep because you're anxious about a test the next day or you're nervous about or you're ex too excited about something that's going happening the next day, right? A lot of us have maybe had that experience. But there's difference when you're having chronic difficulties with sleep, when you're having a hard time falling asleep consistently for a long term. That chronic insomnia can also lead to mood disorders like anxiety or like depression or even post-traumatic stress disorder. Because again, it's making, like I mentioned, it's making you vulnerable to some of these um, disorders. So seeking help when, if you're having chronic sleep problems is very important because like I mentioned, it can lead to some of these other more um, extreme things. So next slide, please. So when should you be concerned about your sleep? 
when you find yourself getting too much or too little sleep, right? I mentioned, you know, the recommend, you know, Allison mentioned the recommended amount of sleep for adults is seven to nine hours, right? And I mentioned depression can, you know, for people who are depressed, they're either getting too little sleep or they're also getting too much sleep, right? So if you find yourself in those extremes consistently, that might signal that something bigger is going on. So when your sleeping is difficult for two weeks or longer, that's usually around the time, right? When you might be having some initial insomnia, some, you know, middle insomnia if it's longer, or even the like terminal insomnia when it's every day, right? So if you find yourself, wow, like I'm having difficult sleeping and it's been two weeks already, um, then, you know, you might, you might start to think about maybe seeking help. Um, when you're having frequent nightmares or night terrors, um, if you're having consistent nightmares every night or, you know, most nights during the week and it's kind of following the same pattern, if you're waking up with your heart rate going up or you're very anxious and it's hard for you to fall asleep again, that might be uh, a sign that, you know, other stuff is going on and might require, you know, you to talk to somebody who seek help as well. Next slide, please. So where to seek help? Like I mentioned, you know, having anxiety or depression isn't only the big, you know, the reason to seek therapy. A lot of students who are not getting enough sleep, um, you know, often find themselves not seeking help because they feel like other students um, are also not getting enough sleep. So it must be normal, right? So like I mentioned, if you find yourself not being able to sleep regularly um, or sleeping too much, for at least two weeks, maybe that's a sign for you to seek help. So the Student Health Center has therapeutic services and has um, you know, mental health clinicians that can help you when it comes to improving your sleep habits, under, you know, helping you understand what's causing some of these sleep disruptions, can help if you're having any comorbid disorders like anxiety or depression. Um, you know, it's free for enrolled students. And because of the pandemic, we are we do have telehealth during COVID-19. So we are seeing um, students through Zoom. And again, it's confidential um, and it follows HIPAA. So confidentiality is a big part and it's also relevant during telehealth. Um, but other ways that you can also seek help if you feel like therapy um, is not something that you're ready to do, you can also talk to your medical doctor or other mental health professional as well. But you know, Allison is a big proponent and so am I of mindfulness and um, our website at Student Health Center, we do have, there's a mindfulness website that she provided um, where you can also learn more about mindfulness and how that can help when it comes to sleep. So please, if you're having um, difficulty sleeping and you want, to, you want help with that, please, um, you know, seek services at the Student Health Center um, and call 805 three, seven, eight, one, four, one, three, to schedule an appointment, um, whether it's medical or it's mental health professional. And again, we do have um, free, um, free visits when it comes to mental health services, up to six sessions per semester. Per, for, for enrolled students, so if you're not oh, an enrolled student, remember to, you're, it's definitely a legitimate reason to contact your own doctor, mental health professional. Well, Elmer, thank you so much for helping me present this important topic to our participants today. I hope that you get a good night's sleep tonight um, and that you start to really consider some of these great strategies for uh, improving your sleep and health. Thank you so much. I hope you come back tomorrow for another full day of these awesome presentations that we've been having. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. Uh, looks like we have one last little, oh, thank you. We have a both, both, this was great. Thank you. So thank you for that. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.